Uh, Tim is a postdoc and HPC administrator at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. In 2011, he received his PhD from University of Paderborn. Uh, his research focus is on HPC storage file systems and automatic parallelization. Tim Seuss, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, this looks great. Okay, um, today I would like to talk about our research project where we pro uh, provide um, QoS, quality of service management, for Lustre, uh, where we use the um, token bucket filter, um, which is installed in the NRS of Lustre. And since I'm here for the first time and we uh, think to um, participate in the Lustre community stronger in the future, I would like to introduce our university at first. And then, so um, Mainz is the capital of uh, Rhineland Palantir. It's quite close to the Rhine. It's um, near to Frankfurt. It is um, founded um, short before um, Christ and it's also famous for its wine, but I'm not sure about this. I was only told this. And we have, <laughs> I don't like wine, sorry. Um, and, um, we have some experiences in um, industrial storing data because the Gutenberg Bible was printed in Mainz. So 500 um, years ago, we always uh, already made um, industrial um, storage. Um, <laughs> and by accident, the University of Mainz was uh, founded in the same uh, time frame. And nowadays, it has about uh, 35,000 students from 150 nations has many different departments and uh, we do research in um, different areas in um, particle and heatron physicists, uh, physics, uh, material science, life science, and so on and so forth. So we have very um, uh, many use cases. And um, we provide HPC systems clusters, Mogon. And Mogon, this is our first um, um, cluster, this um, um, consists uh, or provides 35,000 cores and was installed in 2012. And um, it has a file system of about uh, one petabyte and achieved um, 300 um, teraflops. And um, this is a nice picture of, of a Mogon, our new cluster, or the first stage is not that nice. For this reason, we placed our administrator in between our uh, racks. Um, but uh, this uh, cluster is significantly smaller, but achieves um, um, significantly better, better results. And um, so it has about um, half a petaflop, and this is the first stage. The next stage will be um, um, uh, delivered in the beginning, uh, at the end of this year. And um, yeah, this, um, here we uh, run a uh, five petabyte lustre system, um, which is provided by NEC. So. What, that was, is not what I was invited here. Uh, I am uh, invited here to talk about um, uh, quality of service management in HVC and why do we need, um, and at first I will tell you why we need quality of service management. Then I will tell you a little bit about my, uh, the architectural approaches. And then um, in, in, um, I also will present some results and scenarios. So. When we, uh, when we look into the file system and HPC systems, um, we see this, um, sp um, this burstiness in the accesses. And um, most administrators will tell you they don't like this. Because this, on the one hand, shows, uh, uh, on the one hand side, shows that your um, file system is too big in some situations, and in some situations, it's too small. Um, so we really, um, we really would like to see a flat curve. Where, where we always use the maximum of the bandwidth and where we utilize our file system the best. And also the users have a high demand on quality of service because um, in our situation we have some um, department that spent additional money for the storage. And um, they get more storage, they can store more data, but they do not get more bandwidth. To, to access the storage. And um, they really um, need this bandwidth because they only rely, uh, their results only rely on this, uh, the bandwidth. Um, then we have a lot of malicious users that um, attack somehow the um, file system because they have many, many small files and they slow down all other users. So we, we need some mechanism to punish them. Um, <laughs> 
Sorry, I didn't find another word. Uh, <laughs> And um, another scenario is tech pointing. Uh, sometimes we have really this burst where we have um, where we have to write a lot of data in a shorter period of time, and um, um, this can overload our complete file system for a short period of time. And um, this prolongs the complete runtime of the jobs, and this is not that nice. So. We would love to have a um, um, quality of service management where a user can say, I want to have this um, uh, bandwidth for read and for write, and we want to guarantee this. And we would love to do this on file base. This would be nice. But um, therefore, we have to include uh, several aspects in our architecture, for example, the batch system, and um, also the um, Elastic client and servers. And um, I will talk always about Slurm here, but this also will work with um, 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 LSF or other batch systems, okay? Um, so, our situation is as follows. We have our uh, lustrous um, environment uh, with our clients, our management and beta data server and our OSSs. And we add some components here. We add our quality of service planner and we have to, um, we have already Slurm and we have to modify it a little bit. In other words, we have to provide a new plugin. Uh, additionally, we have to bring some new features to the OSS, but these are only servers that set some parameters. They uh, run beside. Uh, they are not integrated directly into Lustre. So um, our first approach was, um, yeah, we wanted to do everything on file base because some users want to read some files really fast, some files are not that important, or we just need a few bits from these files in, um, sometimes. And um, for this reason, we want to regulate the uh, quality of service per file. So here we can see each um, OST as a resource with a certain bandwidth, and we can see them somehow like cluster nodes that have some resources that are shared among different users. Here the users are jobs. So it should look like this. We have a user that submits a job uh, with a uh, job name, foo compute. Uh, he, he wants to use some resources. And uh, he wants to start this on, um, on a specific um, file, foo bar here, and he wants to have a bandwidth, an I.O. bandwidth of 10 gigabytes per second. Then this request is submitted to our QoS planner. The, this, um, um, the QoS planner asks the MDS uh, what, is, uh, what are the responsible OSTs, and then we can schedule the, the requests here. If there's enough bandwidth available, uh, or if we can fulfill the request, then we acknowledge Slurm and set the policies of the um, network request scheduler on the OSS. So this was our first idea, but this idea has two big problems. At first, this does not scale. This does not scale if we have too many files uh, that are accessed, does not work. And another big problem is the scheduling does not work anymore. Because in the new Lustre, Lustre version, we have the situation that the stripe size can grow and that we do not know the OSTs in advanced. But we have to guarantee the bandwidth on this OSTs. This does not work anymore. Um, for this reason, we changed our approach. And we said, OK, we do not care about files anymore. We just care now about OSS. This is our first phase. This is a research project. Um, so. Let's look what we can do here. So uh, we, um, we keep everything, um, uh, everything almost the same. It's almost the same. We have our Slurm that talks to an QoS fr front end. Uh, this is talking to, an, uh, to the server and the planner. It's talking to the uh, Lustre backend system and controls here everything. And the information what are provided from the um, planner and from the scheduler are somehow monitored and so that we can, in this way we can, can we guarantee band with us. So, now how did we do this? The integration in Slurm is really simple. It's really simple. We can see bandwidth as, uh, just as a uh, global and a local resource. Why do we need two resources for one feature? Because we have an overall um, file system performance or, um, and we have the bandwidth on each node. Each node provides you five gigabytes per second, but the bandwidth of your file system might be 100 gigabytes per second, and this has somehow to um, work hand in hand together. For this reason, we said, okay, the global available um, bandwidth, um, we treat them uh, exactly as um, licenses, one license per megabyte, we have to get one, 
and the local bandwidth is treated as a generic resource and we um, wrote this and here you see such a call and it works quite nice it's uh, really simple uh, users can um, can make use of it then um, I, uh, we need the token bucket filter and the, um, most probably most of you are familiar with the token bucket filter but nevertheless i will introduce it to, uh, quickly um, we have a glossy uh, we have incoming requests they are classified and um, um, dependent on the classes, we have uh, tokens available, and um, for each request, we need one token. If, no, if a token is available, the, the um, uh, request can be processed. Otherwise, it is delayed until a new token is available. Okay. Um, the TBF, um, token bucket filter, is implemented in the um, a network request uh, scheduler, as I already mentioned, and we say one token is approximately one megabyte. So, and we have different classes. We can classify this request by job IDs, uh, user IDs, processor names plus user ID, uh, pro, um, process names plus user names. But, this, and this, um, this um, token rates, how, uh, how fast token reappear, can be set from the administrator or from the batch system in our case. So, but we have two situations. Um, DN, DN, um, DDN made a great job. Um, by um, in integrating two features the, um, they, um, to enable the throughput from uh, multiple flows and the proportional sharing uh, spared bandwidth. Here we, um, we have such a um, situation where we uh, use the throughput for, multi um, um, for multiple flows. Here we have um, 16 jobs and the different uh, jobs um, occupies uh, or requests different amounts of I uh, IOPS. And there are um, uh, most, in, in the first line, you see 15 ones to have uh, 10 IOPS, and uh, there's one job that has, uh, wants to have 10,000, and instead of saying, okay, we do not, we cannot provide 10,000, so everything is scaled down. Um, also, the 10, jo um, 10 IOPS jo uh, jobs, this is somehow against our um, uh, quality of service management because we slow down the jobs by other jobs. On the other hand side, um, um, it, is not, um, uh, it is possible to proportionally um, um, share free bandwidth between jobs. Here we have the situation, we have 16 clients in two jo um, per job, we have two jobs, and one um, job wants to um, uh, use um, 150 IOPS, and the other one wants to use 100 IOPS, and, um, we have, but we have 500 in, uh, available. So we scale both jobs so that we occupy the complete bandwidth. But this is bad for the user because he has no idea how long his jobs really would take. So he cannot plan for the future. Um, this is um, the administrative point of view. Um, the, there's no learn curve for the user. And next time he says, oh, my job was uh, this time so slow and then we have to explain this to the user. So, okay, we have now this component. And now we put everything together. We integrated it really in our test system. For this reason, I like this T-shirt, what is given outside. We really do it, our tests in um, productive systems. Um, um, but our administrators, or head uh, of um, HPC, had some uh, limitations. He said, OK, you are allowed to set the policies on the scratch device. Only um, uh, on the scratch device, and there are two OSSs, um, and in total, 10 OSTs. And you're allowed to set the policy token bucket filter into job ID. And the uh, um, job ID var is set to proc name, so the processor na uh, process name plus the user ID. And on the system, we have the TBF filter version of 2.8. Um, because for, for stability reason, we, we cannot um, in, integrate the fast and the newest version, or administrators have their some um, concerns. And um, also on the client, we set this um, job bar ID. And here we were able to reserve with our Slurm plugin um, bandwidth a priori. This means when we submit a job, we say, OK, we need for the complete job run time this bandwidth. And therefore, we have an, a little client program that just reserves a throughput here in, the, in this case of 100 for 100 seconds for a certain folder to determine the um, OSS in later versions and in a certain job ID to identify the job later. 
Um, so this this um, program is called by the um, um, Slurm plugin. And then uh, Slurm handles automatically the licenses and uh, the um, um, uh, local resources. Um, this is the first step because um, in this case, everybody has to, use, um, has to provide um, bandwidth, uh, his bandwidth needs, and he can say whatever he wants. And we want to couple this somehow with the user's management of Slurm itself, because there are users that spend more money for it, and so they should benefit from it. Um, additionally, we, uh, we can um, throttle down malicious users only by setting one variable in our um, environment. And an, another feature, what is nice, that is we can credit users. We can users that return their res uh, reserved bandwidth earlier as expected, they can have a benefit from this because they, they are good for the community. Um, and um, so they get more, more credits in the future. This would be a possibility. But um, this situation is in HPC system, it's really the case. Um, usually, um, um, for, for such a reservation, it would be necessary that you have a data flow over the, the complete application one. Otherwise, you reserve um, bandwidth and you do not use it. This is bad. For this reason, we provided uh, uh, we provide <laughs> an um, interface for a spontaneous reservation because most applications have few I.O. rates. They have in the beginning, and uh, they read their input data, then they process, and they write some checkpoints. Maybe they read a um, little amount of data, but and in the end, they, they write a lot of data again. So we wrote an um, C++ API for um, uh, spontaneous I.O. accesses, and here you can reserve bandwidth for a certain time span. You can test if the um, reserva uh, uh, reservation is available, and you can re remove your reservation if you are done. And this are the most important functions. You can add reservations asynchronously, so you can uh, say, okay, I need this uh, um, bandwidth, and when it's available, I will use it. Uh, and um, you can proceed with computing. Other, uh, otherwise, um, you can also block your um, you can do your reservation asynchronously, so you block, your program blocks until the reservation is available. And you can remove reservations, and you can, of course, you must be somehow able to test your reservation if you do it asynchronously. Um, why do we need this? Um, when you do your reservation, we cannot say in advance when your reservation will be available, because we have a backfill um, scheduling. And every time a job is finished, earlier than expected, everything is moved to the front. And this causes uh, that you, you, um, um, when we say you, uh, you can start in five minutes, um, maybe the time frame has already vanished because it was shifted to the front. So we need, uh, have this test um, reservation function, what is used. And this, can, um, this feature can be used really good by um, applications like, for example, Espresso++, and here we always, uh, also tested it. And in um, Espresso++ is a uh, molecular dynamics simulation. Or in other tools like SCR, um, this is a checkpointing tool from uh, Lawrence Livermore. And um, both tools are able to say, okay, I want to uh, write a checkpoint when the resource is available, when the, uh, when the file system is available. We can delay it for a while. And um, um, he, here we can exactly use this feature. And here we have an example from Espresso++. They have this dump. XYZ, uh, XYZ um, QoS uh, method, and this simply checks if there's already an, um, if data has already been written. If I need a new reservation, if this is not if if, the, if I'm not waiting to write the data, I start a new reservation and gather my data for a checkpointing, and then I just proceed. And then I check simply is the reservation now active, and if this is the case, I can write the data, otherwise I do my next simulation step, and I look later if the reservation is available. So, we have um, tested this in our system, and sadly I cannot show you real results until now, but it's working quite nice. Um, it's, um, we have integrated it in Slurm, but as I said, it should be possible for other um, batch systems too. And 
it is not only for Lustre, most probably it will also work for other distributed file systems that provide something similar to the token bucket filter. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much, and I'm here for questions. Uh, so, how does a user figure out how much I/O they need, or how do they know how much they should request? This, this is an, another extension what we can, uh, can think about in the future to add some um, artificial learn mechanism or machine learning algorithms that, that learn over the time this application with this input takes as much. But at the moment, it's pure experiences. Um, and I know that the, um, our partners from DDN are working on this, right? So um, to answer that last question, I mean, you might be able to use the job ID statistics. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I did not. The, the, the job the ID statistics that are captured and yeah. stored on the OSTs, um, you know, after a job completes, you might be able to take that and submit, you know, put it in a post email for each job that says, hey, your job used this much I.O. And This is good suggestion yeah. to, to learn over time how uh, jobs behave. Yes, because yeah. uh, most jobs behave similar, but not always the same because um, the, the runtime um, depends on the input quite often, but um, this is a good starting point. And maybe with machine learning algorithms, at the moment everybody's talking about machine learning, what it can do. And, it's not. and um, do you have any plans to add hooks for this into SCR? Sorry, right. I didn't. didn't, didn't. Uh, do you have any plans to add, um, like submit a patch for your scheduling to the SCR, like scalable checkpoint restart library? Um, First, um, we, we are in close co contact to Catherine, who is developing yep. it, and uh, maybe we will do it in the future. But first, we, we must have a perfectly running system where we really can test it. At the moment, it's a research project, and in the next months, I will um, rewrite a lot of code because the main developer in the past, Jürgen Kaiser, has moved to SAP. And I um, um, took his job, and um, now I have to write a lot of things new. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.